Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is David Eagleman. I'm a clinical professor of family medicine at the Warren Albert School of Medicine at Brown University. Welcome to the first in a series of talks on health externalities and corruption of science. First, let me start with some disclosures of conflicts. Warren Albert donated $100 million to Brown University. He made his money running a series of gas stations with stores associated with them. In those stores, he sold cigarettes and beer and wine. Ironic that a university would be supported by a $100 million donation from a person who made money from selling products that make people sick. Nonetheless, those are potential conflicts. I've worked as an expert witness at the request of injured plaintiffs and some companies in talc, asbestos, diacetyl, that's the butter flavoring in popcorn, Vioxx, metal on metal hip implants, and opioid litigation. Lawyers had no input into this presentation. Brown University does not fund or authorize or approve of my research. Brown does not stand behind my research or want, in fact, to get anywhere near it. That's, of course, because the companies whose conduct I expose are frequently donors or potential donors to Brown University. First, health externalities. What are they? Well, when, they, when companies sell a product, it incorporates the costs of the labor to make the product and the materials that go into the product. But if it, the product makes people sick or pollutes the environment, the company doesn't pay for those costs. Those costs are, quote, externalized. They're externalized into the individuals, families, and community that suffer the consequences of exposures to those products. And because the capitalist system encourages companies to externalize costs because profits go up, there are lots of examples of companies producing dangerous products at the expense of illness in people who use them and people who manufacture them. Enough so that this will be a very long series of lectures, unfortunately. We're gonna start with one of the more well-recognized hazards that have caused disease in individuals and communities and polluted the environment, asbestos. What is asbestos? Well, above all, asbestos is a poison. And unlike most poisons that may come in a bottle with a skull and crossbones labeled poison, asbestos comes as a rock that's also a fiber. So it's fibers made from rock, which turns out to be a very useful product if you want to make certain other products. This asbestos is incorporated into the manufacture of other products. It's also sold by itself, but never used as a final product as itself, except in some cloths. Asbestos comes from the Greek word for inextinguishable. It's easy for me to say, which is actually a misnomer. It's a misnomer because asbestos can't ever catch on fire in the first place. So asbestos, if heated to 1500 to 2000 degrees, will form a different chemical composition, eventually called forsterite, 
which is also a fiber unless it's crushed, but it will not burn. Pliny the Elder, a Roman historian, 2,000 years ago, first reported that asbestos was causing health hazards in the slaves who were miners mining the substance. They were getting shortness of breath. 2,000 years later, this was reported in the British literature as a disease named after the fiber called asbestosis, which is a scarring in the lung. We're going into that in more detail later on today. Again, asbestos is a poison. Where does asbestos come from? Well, it comes from the ground like other rocks. It's quarried in open pit mines. Some are huge, several miles across. In those mines, it's only about 5% of the rock at best. The rock mines, the walls are exploded. And then the rock is carried off on conveyors, sorted, crushed, Eventually, the fiber is actually vacuumed up and then sized. Some of the asbestos, most of it is invisible. It's tiny, tiny, tiny fibers. Some can be inches in length. That's the kind that can be woven into cloth. In addition, the mine can use drilling. As you can see, the drilling, along with the explosions, can release a lot of dust. In addition, there are also mines that are underground mines. This is an example of one of those. Now I'm going to show a brief movie showing the mining process. This was uh, published, produced in 1959 with the assistance of Bureau of Mines and Johns Manville, one of the largest mining companies. Here you see the open pit mine. I'm sorry for the quality, but these are old films. These movies should fit the bell. Sorry for that brief commercial. That's the open pit mine, and soon you will see it exploding. This is the mine material being carried away. This is the technique for drilling. The uh, underground mine is uh, bored through, and then explosions are laid, and the mine is exploded. The mine material is then carried away. This is an example of underground mining. As you can see in the underground mining, there's going to be a lot of dust produced. And you can see that the worker has no respirator, no ventilation, protecting him from inhaling the mine material. This is the side view of the mining process in an open pit mine where you'll see it gets exploded. And that section will then be removed after exploding. This is kind of the drilling process that goes on to lay the explosives and to create small fragments of rock that can then, then be uh, processed into the fiber. There were often mills associated with the 
lines so that the fiber would be milled and vacuumed up into bags, which became the final product. The mines now are located in Brazil, Kazakhstan, Russia, China, and Zimbabwe. Although historically the largest mine in the world was in Canada, in Quebec, and the mines that produced amosite and chrysidolite to brown and blue asbestos were in South Africa. These mines have been closed because the European Union banned them and there were political campaigns to stop mining, both to protect the miners and processors in the countries where the material was mined, but more importantly, most of the exports go to developing countries since most developed countries have banned the use of asbestos. This is what asbestos looks like. These are fibers of an inch to two inches. This is chrysotile. This is chrysotile, which is blue. Chrysotile was generally not used in cloth because it was not flexible. The chrysotile was flexible. Under a microscope, they look like needles. They're very thin. A human hair is uh, about a thousandth of an inch. <clears throat> Whereas asbestos is less than a millionth of an inch. Compared to a hair, a human hair is 50 to 70 microns. An asbestos fiber is one micron. A human cell is 10 to 100 microns. So asbestos can fit into and get into human cells. And it does so. And when it gets into the nucleus, it causes mutations to occur. This again goes to size. This is a penny. This little speck here, there are 20,000 or more asbestos fibers. Compare that to a size of a grain of rice or a tack. Asbestos is dangerous because it has no onion properties. Your natural senses do not tell you that asbestos is dangerous. If you were in a snowstorm of asbestos day after day, month after month, for up to three or four or five years, you'd feel fine every day. Then gradually you would get shorter and shorter of breath. But to get that scarring disease and really feel it would take 15 to 20 years. You can't taste the asbestos. You can't smell it. You can't see it because it's invisible unless there's so much that it causes a cloud, but usually in most products, when the asbestos is released, it's invisible. You can't hear it. And of course, it doesn't make your skin irritated. You can't feel it. So it's most dangerous because it's an insidious hazard. You don't recognize you being impaired until many, many years later. The main, most, the most, not the most common, but the most famous cancer caused by asbestos, because asbestos is really the only major cause of this cancer, is mesothelioma, which is a cancer either of the lining of the lung, in this area here, or the lining of the abdomen. Uh, and the asbestos is found deposited mostly in the lung tissue, it's hard to find it in the pleura, although it does get there, but it doesn't go through the lung. Asbestos gets carried from the lung through the bloodstream to all the organs in the body, which is why asbestos can cause cancer in many different locations. The larynx, again, the lining of the lung, the lung itself, the ovaries, and the testes. The ovaries are mesothelial tissue, the same as the lining of the abdomen and lining of the lung, as are the testes. So, the again, the asbestos gets inhaled, gets into the lung, 
They cause mutations in the cells of the lung or the lining of the lung or the ovary. They pass through the bloodstream to the ovary and the testes and the abdomen. You can also get cancer of the lining of the heart as well, also mesothelial tissue. Asbestos are jagged and extremely tiny. This is more or less how they get into the lung. They get carried again to the epithelial cells. This is a blow up of the meso of the pleura, the lining of the lung, and that's where the mesothelioma occurs. The lining of the lung is a visceral pleura. The lining of the chest wall is parietal pleura, and there's a little bit of fluid in between. These are about the thickness of a cellophane. And this is important because the lung moves against the chest wall, and without a little bit of fluid there, you'll have friction and pain. In fact, one of the things that can occur is that in response to asbestos getting in here, you can get calcium deposits and called pleural plaques, and that can impair the ability of the lung to move. You can also get scar tissue, not just in the, in the lung tissue, which eventually becomes asbestosis, but also scarring of the lining of the lung, which can prevent the lung from moving against the chest wall and make it difficult to breathe. And in both places, you get inflammation and DNA damage. And then that results in cancer, which is uncontrolled cell growth. So what cancer is, start, cells start to divide. Normally, cells divide. But there's a process through which that division is controlled. But with cancer, the division just keeps going, and the, 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 what becomes a tumor spreads either locally or throughout the body. Just keeps growing in an uncontrolled way. Asbestos is a product that contains fibers. It came, came out of a bag. They were long and thin. This is a trade name. It's a commercial name. It's not the uh, geologic term for the material in here. I'll go through that in the next slide. But this is some microscopic looks at anthophyllite, one kind of asbestos, and tremolite. In order to be defined as asbestos, they have to be long and th they're long and thin. So the length is three to five times longer than they are wide. And they're between three and mic five microns long at least. So the length is three to five or longer microns. And the width to length ratio is three to one or five to one, depending on the regulation, really. What's in that bag, it contains both fibers that grew as fibers and also fibers that broke off from larger rocks. Those are called cleavage fragments. But they become the, they can be the same size and they're indistinguishable under a microscope. And this can get confusing. We'll have a whole talk on the definition later on. The chemical formula, they're all silicates. So you see that silicon dioxide is part of all of these chemical formulas. Some have magnesium, some have iron, but they both cause cancer. Actinolite was never sold as a commercial product. These are the sales names. Isotal is a sales name and a, a geologic term. Amosite is just a sales name. It stands for Asbestos Mines of South Africa, where they came from. Again, Crisidolite is a sales name. Its technical name is Rebukite. Amosite's technical name is Brunerite. Tremolite is tremolite, was never sold as a product. Anthophyllite, anthophyllite, same name, 
commercially and geologically. This is what they all look like. They can be distinguished a little bit by color and some physical properties. Chrysotile is flexible. The others are not really flexible. They will crack and break. Uh, tremolite can be either. Amosite is generally brown. Persitol is blue. Chrysotile is white. Actinolite is white. And thophylite is white. And thophylite was used a little bit in the United States, imported from Finland, mostly used in, a, in uh, containers, used cement with cement for chemical mixtures because it was resistant to uh, chemical degradation, as was persidolite. Most of the asbestos used in the United States, 95%, was chrysotile. A little less than 3 to 5% was amosite, and the rest, 1 to 2%, was persidolite. And anthophylite was less than 1%. They were used in a variety of products, roof shingles, automobile brakes for 70% asbestos, wall insulation. This is actually fiberglass, but it would be the same if there was insulation made from uh, asbestos, which this is pipe insulation. Pipe insulation was generally 10 to 15 percent asbestos, although uh, amosite pipe insulation made by Unibestus uh, was 70 percent asbestos and also was made into fire resistant clothing and ceiling tiles and 3,000 other products, including rockware, paints, gloves, ceramics which are often made with talc, which is, contains an accessory mineral. In other words, it comes when you dig it out of the ground, it's there. It's not a contaminant. It's present with the talc and hair dryers. Also, talc, baby powder, contain asbestos. When you work with asbestos, it can release dust, mixing cement, which is 3 to 5, 3 to 10 percent asbestos generally releases dust. Sometimes you can't see the dust. Pipe cutting, you may not be able to see the cut dust. Sweeping up asbestos when you clean up is a, the, gives you the highest concentrations of dust. Ripping out asbestos insulation is another source of exposure. That's why these folks have Tyvek suits and respirators. <laughs> Drilling on oil wells, they use asbestos mud in these wells, asbestos miners, of course, are exposed, brake mechanics, ship repairmen. There's a lot of asbestos used in ships, particularly in World War II, Korea, until 1972 or so. How long has it been known that asbestos was bad for you? Well, in the English literature since 1898. England, unlike the United States, had factory inspectors they were female. They were called lady inspectors. Lucy Dean was the, one of these. She inspected asbestos textile facilities. And this is her report to Parliament in 1898. The evil effects of asbestos have attracted her attention. Where they are allowed to rise and remain in the air of a room in any quantity. This is the first recognition that there was no known safe level of exposure. The effects have been found to be injurious, as might have been expected. Nellie Kershaw is the first documented death from asbestos in the medical literature. And she died from asbestos poisoning, which was named asbestosis in a, in a paper written by the pathologist who did her autopsy, he found asbestos fibers where the scarring in the lung was and named the disease asbestosis, which is scarring of the lung after the fiber that caused the scarring. It was based on only one case. The reason for that was Cook had done lots of autopsies and he'd never seen scarring associated with a fiber in the locations and in the manner that he found in Nellie Kershaw's lungs. 
She started work in the textile mill at age 13. She became disabled at age 31 and died two years later at age 33. Johns Manville contested her claim, did not want to pay her disability. Later on, the British inspectorate went back to that Nellie Kershaw facility and studied about 900 workers. They recommended the suppression and control of dust. They found asbestos had caused disease in those, in those textile workers. They called for periodic medical exams. They said that asbestos is fatal. They said that if you see dust in the air, it's hazardous. And this was all in 1930. They said that respirators were only a temporary measure. Most importantly, they specifically told the companies that they needed to give the workers a, quote, sane appreciation of the risk. That's because of the no onion properties of asbestos, but without being told that asbestos was dangerous, their own senses were reassuring. In other words, not only didn't they warn of the risk, but since you could go back in day after day and feel fine, you could get the idea that it wasn't a dangerous job. Merriweather and Price also noted the fact that it took years after first exposure before you got sick. This is called latency. Latency is the number of years from first exposure to when the person first has symptoms of the disease, cancer or asbestosis. He also noted that the people who had the highest exposures got the sickest and had their, can had their cancer or scarring asbestosis occur sooner. In fact, he didn't report on cancer in this paper. So this was just asbestosis occurring sooner. But shortly after this, it was recognized that asbestos could cause lung cancer. That was in 1934 by Wedley. 33 by Wedley. This is an example of latency from the shipyards at Newport News in Norfolk, Virginia. This is for mesothelioma. As you can see, the first cancers didn't occur for 20 to 25 years after first exposure, but they occur, occur as late as more than 60 years after first exposure. So you might start work at age 18 and not get your cancer until you were 80 or 85. The cancers were first recognized in Germany as asbestos related in 1943. Wedler did a series of autopsies on 92 people who had been exposed to asbestos. 16% showed cancer in the lungs or pleura. Even in the expected range in other autopsies of other workers was two to 6%. He concluded that these cancers were from the asbestos and although this paper was published in 1943 in Germany during World War II, it was distributed by the Industrial Hygiene Foundation, an industry organization magazine, in 1945 to over 200 companies. This was mailed to them. In 1973, the Brake Manufacturers Association had a talk on the hazards of asbestos from Weaver, the head of the organization at the time. He reported on a meeting in Lyon, France on asbestos cancer and noted that all commercial types of asbestos could cause cancer. And he said that exposures at low levels had not been reported to cause cancer, but that was unclear what low meant whether these were sufficient. There are other papers that showed that there was no safe level at this time. He noted that chrysotel caused mesothelioma along with the other kinds, and that cigarette smoking enhanced the risk. So if you smoked and had asbestos exposure, you were 100 times, 50 to 100 times more likely to get lung cancer. This was not true for mesothelioma. 
Smoking does not cause mesothelioma, nor does it increase the likelihood that you're going to get mesothelioma. Lung cancer, different kettle of fish. The risk of lung cancer without smoking is about five times greater than non-smokers. The risk of smoking and lung cancer is about 10. The combined risk is 50. Chrysotile has been disputed as a cause of mesothelioma, but there are many studies that show a very high relative risk. That is the number of cancers, percentage of cancers in the exposed compared to what was expected, 31 times more in this Bacon paper. Women living around the Thetford mine, seven times more cancer. This is a chrysotile mine in Canada. And textile workers, slight increase, but other groups have had found huge increases, both in men and women. These are this is 19 times more than expected lung cancer. I'm sorry, mesothelioma, 27 times more. Mesothelioma is essentially unknown unless there's an asbestos or arionite exposure, which is another kind of fire. Hill considerations for asbestos. Hill came up with these things to consider when he wanted to determine whether a substance caused the disease. He wrote this paper because of the tobacco companies claiming cigarettes didn't cause lung cancer, and he wanted to rebut that. He came up with a method for concluding whether or not an association was causal. And as you can see, asbestos has a high strength, high rate ratio. In other words, it causes a great increase in risk. It's consistent findings in animal studies and in humans from different work groups from different countries. It's not linked to a specific cancer, but neither is smoking or most other carcinogens. Most carcinogens cause more than one cancer. In these studies, obviously the exposure came before the disease. There was a dose response relationship. The higher the dose, the more cancers that could cause. It was biologically plausible because asbestos was found to cause mutations. It was coherent because mutations are known to cause cancer. In experiments with animals, they found it caused cancer. And analogy, other fibers also caused mesothelioma. There's no known safe level of asbestos this has been found by many international and domestic organizations. IARC, FDA, the United States Congress has taken a position, the National Institute for Occupational Safety Health, the National Cancer Institute, OSHA, the European Commission, World Trade Organization, etc. This comes from a mega mouse study. In other words, the conclusion that there's no safe level. They did a study of mice and a carcinogen. They found they started with 15 mice controls, unexposed, 15 exposed to the carcinogen. They found an increase. They cut the dose in half and doubled the number of mice. They got up to 15,000 mice and as many decreases in dose and still found an increase in cancers. So that was the conclusion that there was no safe level of exposure to a carcinogen. In other words, the higher the exposure, the more cancers. But if you project, because you can't do this study in humans, you can never get to one or two or 10 or even a million fibers <clears throat> in humans, but you have to do, so you have to project this, projects through the animal studies, the mouse studies and other studies that just a little bit of exposure will increase the risk of getting cancer. And it, the amount and duration has been reported to be as little as one day. So one day of exposure is enough to give you mesothelioma. And that concludes 
the first lecture in a series of externalities.